So I, I'm Patrick Clausen. I'm the director of research here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a, a Morning Star fellow, director of our Iran program. And um, thank you very much for coming out on this cold day um, uh, for a discussion about uh, Nader's book. Uh, a few years ago, I heard through the grapevine that Nader was interested in taking a leave of absence from CENTCOM in order to write a book about uh, the Revolutionary Guards and especially about the Quds Force. And uh, uh, so uh, I reached out to him and we quickly saw a common interest in him sitting here while he worked on this book. Um, and I'm very pleased to see that uh, it's come out so quickly. Um, so uh, you can find Temperature Rising, Iran's Revolutionary Guards and Wars in the Middle East. Uh, Nader is selling it, uh, if you want, the same price you can buy on Amazon uh, outside. And that will be also after this forum if you want to get him to sign it. Um, and as he pointed out to us uh, when he started this project, uh, very few people have uh, focused on the Quds Force. There's been some other scholarly works about uh, Iran's military and to discuss the Revolutionary Guards, but not really uh, the particularly the, the role of the Quds Force. And so um, I th we think that his account is, is uh, um, quite unique. Um, but one of the other interesting scholarly works about the Revolutionary Guards is by uh, the comment one of the car commentators today, and that's uh, Ali al Foner, who is now a senior fellow at the uh, Arab Gulf States Institute and who first came to Washington to be here at the Washington Institute oh so many years ago. Um, and um, uh, he wrote a study at AEI on uh, Iran Unveiled, How the Revolutionary Guards is Turning Theocracy into Military Dictatorship, um, particularly looking at, at the role of the Revolutionary Guards inside Iran, whereas Nader's focus is on their role outside Iran more, more so. So he will offer a few comments. And uh, then we've also asked uh, Alex Vatanka, who's a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, and a longtime managing editor with Jane's Islamic uh, Affairs, um, to um, comment as well uh, about uh, the role of the revolutionary. He's written a great deal about the Revolutionary Guards over the years uh, and uh, has followed closely the Iranian military. And so we've asked him to say a few words as well. So I'm looking forward to uh, a spirited discussion. I don't think that our our authors entirely agree. Uh, we always think that creative tension is best for uh, making one of these forums more exciting. So uh, um, uh, with that, let's uh, turn to Nader. All right, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to today's event. Uh, let me just start from thanking again the Washington Institute for providing me the home to write this book uh, with the uh, Washington Institute's leadership and Patrick especially with all the support they give me. Um, I'm really thankful. Without, without that support, I could not have uh, finished this project this early. Uh, a lot of you I see in the, in the crowd who have been uh, friends, old friends and supporters, and I thank every single of you for encouragement you have given me to, to actually do this book. Uh, with the short time we have here today, I'm going to just uh, bring up three of the questions that we struggled, I struggled uh, during writing the book. Uh, uh, and, I, and I sometimes say I and sometimes say we because uh, it was more than me. Uh, I had a greatest team of uh, research assistants and interns helping me in writing this book. Uh, Erica is here in that corner, right there, and uh, uh, and uh, it was was uh, the the uh, the uh, assistant they gave me was priceless. Those of you who have written recently books, you know, I mean, having uh, research assistants and interns at that level is really priceless uh, to 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 do the book. So when I say I and we, I I mean me and all my research assistants and interns who actually worked either on parts or all of parts of this book. Uh, it was a struggle to, uh, on, on two or three uh, points, and I, I'm, I'm going to bring up those points uh, for opening discussion here. Uh, one of them was actually who and how 
uh, the Rhodes Force was started. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, 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 not, not a lot of uh, scholarly uh, 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 writings on that. Uh, Ali and, uh, and, and Alex are the experts on those, and they are, I'm so glad uh, that they joined me here uh, on this panel. Uh, so we had, we had to go to, through a lot of interviews, uh, including interviews with the uh, 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 senior uh, Iranian officials who at the time of the revolution uh, held uh, senior positions at the G uh, IRGC. One of them was actually a member of the five-member leadership council of the IRGC. Uh, to see how, how did that happen. Uh, um, the best we could is to go back in history and, uh, and count the days back, before, uh, months before revolution, to the days of Khomeini in Paris and his supporters, advisors in Paris. Uh, and the main advisors of uh, Khomeini's advisors uh, were actually expecting a long protracted war in Iran uh, to get the Shah out, even as late as three months prior to the victory of the revolution. I was in Paris at the time, and I was in that, in that compound going back and forth, and I, and I, and I heard them uh, firsthand how, how they, uh, how they uh, imagined uh, there, was going, there were going to be a long protracted war because A, they thought Shah would not leave. B, they thought even if he leaves, uh, US and uh, Iranian uh, uh, military will going to uh, uh, stage a coup uh, uh, and do not let Khomeini come to power. Uh, so much so that they were talking openly in Paris about forming a people's army uh, and they were using uh, Vietnamese uh, model uh, those times. A people's army to not only to get the uh, Shah out, but also to guard against any US uh, military uh, or Iranian military coup. Uh, and uh, they had actually sent one of their main advisors to Lebanon uh, to, uh, to uh, form uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, cadres for the People's Republic, for the People's Army, and that was Chamron. Uh, who went to, to uh, who later became the first uh, uh, defense minister of Iran? As a matter of fact, before before uh, before he went to uh, to uh, to Iran Iraq before he went to the front during the Iran Iraq war, I had a chance when I was a journalist there. I had a chance to interview him, and and he confirmed that that uh, that was the thinking about establishing a people's army uh, in Iran, uh, very much on the. Uh, model of the leftist model of the people's uh, people's armies uh, that was popular during during that time, uh, except this time with the uh, with the overarching Islamic Islamic ideology. Uh, uh, but Shah left, uh, as a matter of fact, the regime collapsed in on itself. Uh, uh, but the idea of the people's army never died among those advisors. Uh, and uh, weeks, uh, even few weeks after revolution, they started talking about how we can uh, um, uh, recruit uh, and uh, arm and uh, organize uh, Shia uh, militants who were in Iran. Um, the very first indication of a Quds Force-led uh, foreign uh, Shia militia force type, if you will, was the recruitment of Afghan. Afghan uh, 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 refugees in Iran who had fled at the time the socialist government in Kabul, and they had, they had fled into Iran. So they, they organized them into a smaller groups uh, to, be, uh, to be trained and resent back to Afghanistan in order to fight the socialist government. And also, uh, later on, the, uh, the Soviet who invaded, uh, who invaded Afghanistan a few months after uh, victory revolution in Iran. So the... Uh, the, uh, the first indications of that kind of, ideal, uh, that kind of organization we saw it in, in, uh, uh, in recruitment of the Afghans. Uh, years later, decades later, uh, uh, the uh, sons, daughters, uh, sons basically, and grandsons of those Afghan recruits uh, were recruited again to be sent to Syria under the, uh, under the banner of the Fatimiyun division. Uh, but really, that's the first indication we have during the first, and it, IRGC was not even formed at that time. It was the, uh, the uh, uh, group of the advisors who were getting together and trying to, trying to uh, uh, recruit these things before even IRGC started. So this whole idea of the foreign legion of Shia militias goes back to the very first 
literally weeks of the Iranian Revolution. Uh, when they are, uh, and, and of course, continued on then with Iraqi uh, uh, exiles in Iran who had fled the Saddam regime coming to Iran. And, not, uh, and this is before Iran-Iraq war. They recruited them to uh, send them to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the front to fight, uh, to fight uh, Saddam during the, if you, some of you remember my age, uh, remember that there were a lot of border scrimmages between Iran and Iraq before the war started. And these uh, uh, Shia, uh, uh, Iraqi uh, militants played a major role in that, which later on were organized into Badre and other, other, uh, other uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, later. Uh, and then, of course, when the, when the, um, uh, uh, during the first years after the war, uh, the, uh, 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 going back to Lebanon, people, uh, the uh, revolutionary, the Iranian revolutionary uh, Islamists knew Lebanon very well. Chamran had, had, had great uh, 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 connections there, and they, uh, you know, formed the Hezbollah from, uh, they encouraged uh, 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 dissension and, and split within the Fatah, uh, within the uh, uh, Amal, and even, even within some of the leftist organization in Lebanon to form, uh, to, bring out the, to bring, out the, bring out the Shias militants from those organizations to form the uh, Lebanese, uh, 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 Lebanese as well. So this is what I'm saying that organizationally, the idea of getting uh, uh, foreign m militants who, are sh who were Shia uh, started from the very first days of the revolution. Uh, they started organizing Af Afghans, Iraqis, and then finally Lebanese, uh, which became the Hezbollah became the jewel of the of the Shia militias. Uh, uh, so uh, I started. That's where we could we could we could pinpoint uh, uh, the start of that. Uh, the doctrine uh, of uh, uh, of that was that this is what we struggle a lot. Uh, uh, was Quds Force created as an independent unit, answerable to the government and the supreme leader, or was it really a kind of a totally independent, not even answerable uh, to anybody, and, 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 and could, have, could have free hand doing whatever they want uh, in, in outside Iran? Uh, um, after the war, uh, f the extraterritorial branch of the IRGC morphed into what we now call the Quds Force. Uh, I, I talked a few minutes ago uh, about one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, founders of the IRGC. He just walked into the room. Uh, that's Bosena Sazgar right there. And, uh, and uh, he just walked into the room and he, uh, 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 during during many, many, many hours of interviews uh, with him, uh, along with uh, er Erica, uh, he, uh, he gave us the detail, the details about how the first days in Paris, they were thinking about the, uh, the uh, 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 people's, uh, people's Army, how that, uh, uh, how that idea never died, and how when they formed the IRGC finally, uh, uh, it was always an extraterritorial branch attached to it uh, to, do, to do the work uh, uh, among the, uh, the Shia militias. Uh, the, um, uh, I was, let me go back to where I left off, is, was that uh, was the Quds Force uh, answerable to anybody in Iran uh, or, or, or they were giving, given uh, uh, free hand to do whatever they want to do outside the country? Uh, um, let me answer it by, by one, uh, going back a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, the, when the revolution happened, really Iran had two uh, different centers of power. You had the government running day-to-day -day day -day affairs of the government, uh, of, the, of the country, and then you have a revolutionary organ uh, uh, headed by the supreme leader, sitting in the office of the supreme leader, uh, organizing the uh, full revolution and organs like uh, IRGC and the Quds Force were part and parcel of that revolutionary uh, revolutionary uh, organ. So definitely uh, the Quds Force was not answerable to the government, to the presidents. And no matter if the president was right, 
uh, on the right or the left of the of the centers in Iranian politics, from Ahmadinejad to uh, to uh, 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 Khatami, uh, doesn't doesn't make any difference. The Quds Force was not reporting to the president or to the government. That government was outside the purview of the revolutionary organs of Iran. Uh, the Quds Force were within that structure that was led by the Supreme Leader's Office. Uh, so, so, at, so we could answer the questions of was it answering to government easily? No, the answer was no. Uh, relationship with the Supreme Leader was much more complex than we thought. Uh, because the Quds Force, more we did the research, more we find out that the Quds Force was organized in a way in a way, to even at last the Islamic Republic, with or without the Supreme Leader. Did the Ghost Force need the Supreme Leader? Of course, they need the Marjayat as their, as their, uh, as their justification for their, for the, uh, to, to bring in the uh, Shias all over, all over the world uh, the, uh, on, the, on the militant uh, interpretation of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Iranian Marjayat. Uh, they, so they did need the Supreme Leader. Supreme Leader needed uh, the IRGC, of course, for, for internal security, but also the Ghost Force outside to push in Khomeini's uh, 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 major theory, uh, doctrine that the revolution was not just about Iran, was about the whole region, and the whole region should rise up, uh, uh, should rise up to free themselves. So they needed that, uh, but uh, uh, not to the point uh, that uh, to organize it so independently that they can outlast even the Islamic Republic. How they did that? They created, the Quds Force has its own independent businesses, business uh, 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 outside the country. Uh, uh, I see uh, Ali Safavi in the, in the, in the room. Uh, they've done a great job, uh, 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 NCRR, had a great job on, on actually cataloging uh, the foundations that are owned or controlled by uh, the IRGC, and most of those, most of those, uh, most of those uh, organs uh, uh, actually have uh, Middle Eastern branches and are actually actively uh, doing business in Middle East. So, Quds Force owns those businesses or controls those businesses, which include, by the way, transportation, includes uh, uh, includes uh, 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 banking, and, and all of that. They have caches of, uh, of, uh, of uh, weapons all over the Middle East. More importantly, they have re nearly 50,000 uh, uh, active uh, Shia youth organized, armed uh, 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 by the Quds Force. So they have all of those. I'm not saying that the Quds Force is ready for the Islamic Republic to fall in Iran, but even if something happens in Tehran and uh, Islamic Republic cannot continue, the Quds Force will continue its work in, in, in the region. That was our, our, our conclusion from our research. Uh, so, uh, so that makes it really that much more important to bring up the question that who are these guys? Uh, for example, Soleimani reports directly to Supreme Leader. What, what is this line of reporting? What happens if something happens in Tehran? And that was our understanding that this is so, uh, the organization is set up so independently that can function even without Tehran. Uh, which runs against the orthodoxy in this city about how the Quds Force and IRGC are actually, uh, actually organized. Uh, uh, I know I'm running out of time very fast. So uh, now, uh, on the second point, that was what, ha what happened to, to the Quds Force, how it was organized, and the doctrine of, of the organization. Uh, on the second point about their, their military doctrine, uh, Quds Force has really, uh, has really ev uh, evolved its military doctrine throughout these years. Uh, uh, in the height of the Syrian civil war in Aleppo in late 2006, we could see the pinnacle of that, of that organization. Uh, the uh, 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 Soleimani brought in about 50,000 uh, members of the Shia militias uh, near Aleppo. Uh, they brought in about 2,000 of Quds Force per personnel near the Aleppo. They brought in uh, Artesh and uh, an IRGC specialized unit like armor, uh, uh, like a UV, a UAV, uh, like a special forces and ballistic missiles into, into, into the bat battle space. 
and uh, and uh, uh, the only thing they lacked was the Air Force, which uh, the, uh, uh, Putin provided them with uh, with uh, with open arms. Uh, so that's how that's how the doctrine evolved. It's not just an asymmetric uh, 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 way of war. Uh, it has uh, that, but also it has elements of uh, regular warfare. Uh, that's why they, you bring in those uh, those support units from uh, from regular military like IRGC and the and the Artesh and. Uh, 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 for example, special forces uh, from from uh, from those branches. So that's where the Quds Force uh, 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 way of war is going. And I think Aleppo teaches us uh, uh, is is a window to the future fights that is going to be led by the Quds Force in the region. Uh, after Aleppo, everybody thought, okay, uh, Assad is saved. Uh, the uh, uh, moderate Sunni uh, opposition that they were in Syria to defeat uh, are basically weakened, uh, pushed back out of the major, major, major fronts. So Iran could have, uh, should have basically uh, call off all, all its forces and leave Syria. No, they did not. They changed the strategy, and the strategy became from opposing the uh, opposing the Sunni opposition to to challenging Israel on on the Syrian soil. And that's where uh, the things started going sour, uh, going down for the, for the Quds Force, because uh, that ran against their own ideology, uh, their own doctrine, probably under pressure from some, sort, some, uh, uh, some Shia uh, quarters to challenge uh, uh, Israel, which was a long dream of the Shia, Shia, uh, Shias in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in Iran. And uh, uh, for, uh, a good example of that was May 9, May 10, uh, massive Israeli air attack on all of the uh, Quds Force installations uh, in Syria with Iranians cut, with, uh, unprepared, under-equipped to, to challenge Israel. So that's uh, bring me to the, my last point, which I'm sure Patrick had just reminded all of us, that this is a policy forum. At the end of the day, we have to see what are the implications for the U.S. policies of everything we say. Uh, uh, the, uh, the change in strategy that the Quds Force has done is key uh, that opening a lot of windows for the West and for the U.S. Uh, to counter Quds Force influences in the Middle East. Uh, they, are, they have opened themselves, exposed themselves, and uh, keeping a land bridge uh, operating and keeping, a special force, uh, keeping their forces in uh, permanent bases and uh, 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 is not, is not uh, really not the way the doctrine wa was, meant, uh, was meant to work. And it, uh, so uh, back to US, is the sanctions working? No, I've just, I've just described to you how independent the Quds Force is. It can even outlast the Islamic Republic. So sang the current sanctions against the Quds Force are not going to be major effect. Not that it doesn't have any effect. Of course, it will have any effect. Whenever, whenever the oil uh, uh, money goes, the, the percentage of the oil that goes to the IRGC and the Quds Force will go down. Of course, it will have their own effect. Is it going to uh, stop uh, uh, Quds Force from, uh, from, uh, and its Shia militias uh, from what they do in the, uh, uh, in the Middle East? No, it will not. Uh, they might change a little bit here of tactics, uh, de-emphasize some theaters of operations versus the others, but is not really going to change to change the tactics. Uh, we are going to have Quds Force and its Shia militias as the headquarters of the Shia militancy in the Middle East for years and decades to come, with or without the Islamic Republic. Uh, so, uh, uh, what could the U.S. do aside from sanctions? That's uh, um, let me just make this point before finishing up, is that I don't believe the U.S. is in, uh, in any mood, the White House is in any mood of doing anything more than sanctions at this time. Uh, but if, if uh, they, are, they are working on how to counter, how to counter the Quds Force, of course, uh, uh, disrupting the freedom of movement of the Quds Force in the, uh, in the region, disrupting their financials outside Iran, specifically targeting companies and businesses that are run by the Quds Force outside Iran is key uh, 
to uh, to uh, to, un to our under uh, to U.S.'s undertaking uh, and uh, uh, denying uh, denying the Quds Force uh, easy uh, access to airports and to the ports all over all over the Middle East, uh, denying them uh, easy uh, air uh, aircraft like. Uh, uh, air, uh, Iranian airliners transportation to uh, in the daylight from Tehran to Beirut or from Tehran to to Damascus to carry personnel and uh, and arms. All of those things should be added above and beyond the sanctions. Sanctions themselves are not going to be in. Uh, now depends how the Quds Force is going to react to those. Uh, the last question we struggled was that any chances of military conflict between Israel and Iran, military conflict between US and Iran on, in Syria, in Iraq, or in Yemen? Yes, that chance is very, very much alive. Uh, I think we are just uh, uh, only away from a uh, conflict between, between those countries by just one successful uh, ballistic missile attack on Riyadh airport or some other, some other strategic places. So there, there is tense. Uh, are they going to start the war? Of course not. That's not the plan. But it could happen anytime because of misunderstanding and that. And with that, thank you so much again for coming in. I'll be more than happy at, at the end uh, to, to be with you and sign the, sign the book. Thank you. Thank you, Nader. And now Ali. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for your kind invitation and for providing me with this opportunity to share my analysis uh, with you. Exactly 20 years ago, a book published by the Washington Institute completely and wholly and totally changed my life. Back then, I was a research assistant at the Social Democratic Group of the Danish Parliament, and suddenly I see on my screen that there is this think tank in Washington, and I had no idea what it was, which had published a book about the presidency of Mr. Khatami. Now, that was very surprising, because Mr. Khatami was elected in 97. By 1998, less than a year into the presidency of Mr. Khatami, there was this think tank in Washington which had already published a book. So I sent an email to the think tank, and a gentleman whom I also did not know, a certain Dr. Patrick Clausen, <laughs> was kind enough, free of charge, to send me the book. I read the book and I was so impressed that I immediately applied for unpaid internship at the Washington Institute. <laughs> so it was a very good investment for both of us. For both of us. You are not the only one. What I discovered this time is that I'm just as uh, impressed by, uh, by Mr. Osquiz's book that I was with the little collection of essays that I read 20 years ago. But I also very seriously disagree with Mr. Osquiz when it comes to very fundamental issues about this book, very, very fundamental issues. And let me tell you what the most fundamental of all these fundamentals is. It is that Mr. Osquiz is a gentleman, so he relies on the orthodoxy and orthodox knowledge and information about the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and the Quds Force. So he takes it at face value. I never do such a thing. I'm not a gentleman when it comes to scholarship. I question every single piece of information that I'm presented with. And the issues that I will be shaking today, the pillars of wisdom about the Quds Force today, are three. One, who established the Quds Force and when? I disagree with Mr. Osqui. Two, how did the organizational structure of the Quds Force evolve over the years? Again, I disagree with Mr. Osqui. And finally, I fundamentally disagree with Mr. Osqui and the orthodoxy here in Washington about the nature of the relationship between the Quds Force and its clients. First things first, who established the Quds Force? In the book, Mr. Osqui and the orthodoxy of the Quds Force research tells us that 
The Ghost Force was established a few weeks after the revolution in Iran. So the revolution was, was one on February 11th, you know, a few weeks later, the Ghost Force was established. Today, Mr. Roskui made a slight alteration in, in, in that explanation, telling that maybe something happened, you know, in Paris, and maybe there was some story in Lebanon oh, wait, which, which, which uh, <laughs> had an influence uh, on, on establishment of the Ghost Force. Now, I totally agree with Mr. Roskui that the Ghost Force was not established a few weeks after the revolution. No. Establishment of the Ghost Force predates the establishment of the Islamic Republic. But it also predates the days of Grand Ayatollah Khomeini in Paris. Mr. Khomeini did not establish the Quds Force, and it was not in 1979. The Quds Force, ladies and gentlemen, was established by Egyptian military dictator Jamal Abdel Nasser in Cairo in 1964. If you do not believe my account, I'm urging you to read two pamphlets published by the Iran Freedom Movement on the occasion of the death of Mustafa Chamran, the second defense minister of the Islamic Republic in Kurdistan. In those pamphlets, the Iran Freedom Movement discloses, discloses that after the coup of 1953, they no longer believed that it was possible to engage in a political fight against the Shah's regime. Democracy was not possible. They were forced to initiate a military phase of struggle against the Shah's regime. The pamphlet also discloses that they were considering sending people for training to the Soviet Union or to the Eastern Bloc countries. Now, remarkably, none of those countries were willing to provide the Iranian revolutionaries with such training because they were normalizing their relations with the Shah's regime. <clears throat> they did not want to engage in a fight against the Shah. The only country willing to provide Iranian revolutionaries with money, training, and arms was the Egypt of Jamal Abdul Nasser. So in 1964, Engineer Mehdi Bazargan and Ayatollah Mahmoud Talegani, the spiritual father of this particular group, sent a delegation of three individuals to Cairo. Mustafa Chamran, Ibrahim Yazdi, and Sadeh Qobzadeh. The three of them initiated a process which helped them train an entire generation of partisan fighters. The training took place in military camps which also was training Palestinian terrorists, the Fatah movement and the PLO. In other words, the Iranian revolutionaries from the very beginning became connected to a world revolutionary movement. They did not believe that their revolution was limited to the borders of Iran. They believed that they were engaged in an anti-imperialist struggle. And for those people, remarkable enough, Imperialism only referred to the United States and not to the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire. Now, there is a friend in the panel who believes in immaculate conception. Now, we Shia, we are much more rational than that. If there is a mother and there is a child, there must necessarily also be a father. So if Egypt under Jamal Abdel Nasser was the mother of the Quds Force, who was the father? The father, ladies and gentlemen, was no one but his imperial majesty, the Shah of Iran, and the Sabak. Now you're asking me how and why. The answer is very simple, ladies and gentlemen. Just as the Iranian revolutionaries were seeking military training, assistance, and money all over the Middle East, the professional intelligence service of the Shah, the Sabak, tried to infiltrate those organizations. So what did it do? This highly professional organization tried to infiltrate all Shia societies outside of Iran because they were chasing the revolutionaries. In 1979, one of the first government agency buildings which was seized by the revolutionaries was the headquarter of the Savak, the Shah's secret service. The Savak officers, who were even before the revolution expanding Shia networks outside of Iran, 
and who saw their own career at perils now that the Shah's regime had collapsed, half of them joined the prime minister's office. They established Savama, which was the organization established after, after the Shah's secret service. The other half, which was the foreign espionage section of the Savak, they joined the nascent Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Now, imagine the combined forces of the Savak and the revolutionaries, the combined organizational talent and network of the Savak and the revolutionaries all over the Middle East. It was this formidable organization which made the Quds Force the capable force that it is today. Without the help of the Savak officers, without the help of the revolutionaries who had been training since 1964, establishment of Lebanese Hezbollah would not have been possible, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the first point where I refute totally and completely the orthodoxy. The second point is the evolution of the organizational structure of the Quds Force. Mr. Oskui and the orthodoxy want us to believe that there was only one Quds Force organization. This, ladies and gentlemen, is ahistorical. There were several parallel organizations within the body of the revolutionary guards, which were all engaged in the export of the revolution business. One of them had the name the Quds Force. The other one was the Office of the Liberation Movements. The two were competing with each other. The one was not the precursor of the other. And it was only after the scandal of the Iran-Contra affair that the Quds Force people managed to systematically execute more than 50 members of the other organization, the Office of the Liberation Movements, that it was possible to have one organization. So also on this point, I am refuting the orthodoxy. The final point is more discussion oriented. Uh, I'm not so sure that I totally disagree uh, with, with the orthodoxy, but uh, well, you know, for the hell of it, you know, let's have the argument. I got the idea about what is the nature of the relationship between the Quds Force and its clients uh, from a French scholar, a lady called uh, Laurence Luer. Dr. Luer uh, produced a very, very nice book, Transnational Shia Politics, in which there is a very, very short reference to one of the Shia organizations, the Iraqi Da'wa party members, who went to Iran. And he explains how the Iraqis managed to manipulate the Iranians in order to advance their own agenda concerning Iran's Iraq policy. That was a very interesting point. Now, being a skeptic by nature, I, of course, did not believe Dr. Luer. So I began my own studies, thank you, my own studies about the nature of the relationship between the Quds Force and the, the proxies. Were the proxies manipulating the Quds Force, or was it the, the Quds Force which was in total control of the proxies? So I made a comparative analysis of speeches made by, by Grand Ayatollah Khomeini and the date of foreign delegations visit Iran. And I found out that Dr. Luar was actually right. Whenever Grand Ayatollah Khomeini received a delegation from Iraq, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini was calling for toppling an overthrow of the Ba'ath regime in Iraq. Whenever he received a delegation of Saudi Shia, he would be calling for overthrow of the House of Saud. In other words, if there was a delegation from Côte d'Ivoire, you know, visiting Iran, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini would be calling for the overthrow and toppling of the Ivorian government. This is how the situation was. So we cannot be 100% sure that the Islamic Republic and the Quds Force is always in total control of the proxies that he it wants to be in control of. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is not my declaration of war against Mr. Roskui, whom I hold in very, very high esteem. This is a declaration of war against orthodoxy. And I promise you that I will fight the orthodoxy with all my power to the last drop of uh, ink in my fountain pen. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Well, I, I promised you some differences of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, Alex. Thank you to the Institute. Thank you to Patrick for inviting me. Uh, I'm afraid what uh, um, to follow now will be nothing other than napping material after <laughs> we just heard. I can't beat that, and I won't even try, and I'll be very brief. Um, but let me first start off by congratulating my dear friend Nader with this uh, wonderful book that you've produced. You are probably the only person I know who has managed to sit with your crossed legs in front of the Ayatollah on the floor and then managed to work at the senior level in the Pentagon. <laughs> I, I can only imagine that security clearing process was different in your case. But um, interesting uh, life story and therefore the book alone just to see how you see uh, the evolution of the Islamic Republic and the Quds Force from your eyes, as I said, would be unique. The book is rich in history, data, and scenarios that I think anybody concerned about the Middle East ought to read. The part that I want to sort of talk about, probably more than anything else, is the scenario part to the point about what's relevant for policy making. Um, I don't want to go where Ali just went, but I have fundamentally one big question when it comes to the Islamic Republic, and that's this notion that the system works well, and the system has always worked well, that there is this blueprint. There are players that pl play by the blueprint, and that's why Iran acts and behaves the way it does. I fundamentally don't read Iranian history that way. I don't believe in the system. I don't see that wonderful linear approach to how things have unfolded. I think the Iranian regime is much more of a product of its reaction to circumstances, both at home and in the region. Um, I don't think Ayatollah Khomeini had any idea what he wanted when he was on that flight from Paris to Tehran. Had no idea what he wanted. I think he was under influence a lot of people with different ideas. I read a declassified CIA cable that assumed at the time that the man believes the last thing he heard from the last person he saw. I want to make this point because this takes me now, I guess, to the core of my argument. How does the United States tackle Iran, the Islamic Republic? Is it ideological? You could obviously make the case it is in some ways. But, but how deep is this, how deep-rooted is this ideology? Let me give you an example. Anybody who looks at the first few months of the evolution of the Islamic Republic cannot but agree with me that if Khomeini had any idea about Islamic solidarity, he would have acted much more smartly than he did. In fact, you could make the argument that what he achieved in a very short period of time was quite extraordinary. He managed to mobilize the entire Islamic world, with a few exceptions, against him and against the revolution. From the Moroccans to Zia al of Pakistan, from the Turks to the Gulf Arabs, they all mobilized against him. And if you are an Islamist and you don't believe in national boundaries and you don't think this is about Iran, this is about something much bigger, how on earth did he then uh, carry on the way he did. I don't have to point it out to this group of people. We know who his friends were. Ma uh, Gaddafi of Libya and uh, Hafez al-Assad of Syria. Was that a bad ideology? Were those two Arab leaders Islamist of, of any sort? Uh, they were not, as we know. That, and that takes me to my point. This regime, for the last 40 years, is much better understood by looking at it as an opportunistic creature than a, an ideological creature. Um, and I want to, again, go into the Quds Force now that it's on the uh, border with Israel and wants to rechange the world map and all the rest of it, certainly the regional map, ask ourselves a simple question. Who influenced Khomeini on the question of Israel? Did Khomeini influence the Palestinians, the Lebanese, or the Hafez al-Assad of this world, or vice versa? I would argue it was the Arabs who influenced the Iranians. I don't think Khomeini really cared or knew much about the Palestinian issue. So again, to me that says ideology was not a big part of it, at least not when it began. You can make the argument 40 years we're in a different place, but to begin with, um, the issue of the Palestinians uh, was not the top of the man's mind. It was very interesting. I read in another's book that very early on in the revolution, 17 Palestinians show up um, in Tehran. 
and obviously giving the keys of the de facto Israeli embassy to the new Palestinian representatives. Um, and I can tell you another anecdote I'm working on, as you know, my own book, and members of the Iranian marching band in Tehran at the time refused to play for Arafat. They refused to play for him because they were obviously the legacy from the days of the Shah. But my point is, those 17 Palestinians, what happened to them? Within a few months, those same Palestinians, probably not the same Palestinians, but many Palestinians found themselves fighting on the side of Iraq against the same Khomeini that had so uh, beautifully spoken about the need to help the Palestinians. Again, to me, that suggests there's a big disconnect between vision, ideology, partners that you want to cultivate, and what really happened. Um, so again, yeah, in, in a nutshell, I think this um, ideological basis of the revolution has been a work in progress for the last 40 years. Um, it's much better. And I think if you look at Nader's book, and he raises so much in terms of data, the book is rich in data, in scenarios, and certainly food for thought in terms of where we ought to be looking at for the next crisis to hopefully prevent. But if you look at those case studies that, that Nader mentions, like Lebanon, Afghanistan in the 1980s, Iraq, Yemen, all of them, as I said, in the book, what do they all have in common? Did Iran go in into a single place that was perfectly in harmony with itself and create tension? I don't think you can find a single example. I might be wrong, but I don't think you can. No, instead what you have is Iran, the Islamic Republic, Quds Force, or whoever was behind it, walks into places where you have power vacuums. Somebody else messed up. The Iranians stepped in. It's true for Lebanon, Hezbollah, in 1982. It's true for Iraq, post-2003. It's true for Yemen today. Somebody else messed up. It could have been the United States. It could be the Saudi Arabia. But it wasn't because of the, 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 the strength of the Iranian message or capabilities. It was because there was an easy play to be had and Iran stepped in. What the Iranians right now are doing in Yemen cost them probably a few hundred, at the very most millions, at the very most, compared to the billions that the Saudis and the Emiratis are spending, fighting wars in the region on the cheap uh, in, in many ways. But I would also make the argument, again, going back to what's relevant policy-wise, Iran is not the only country that can act uh, opportunistically. The United States, too, should and can act opportunistically. I think for the uh, U.S. policymaking community, the key here is to look for cracks in this Iranian proxy model. And it's certainly not an invisible model. The proxy model of Iran is one that I think the U.S. and allies can attack on from different, uh, from different um, fronts, levels, if you will. Two obvious cracks to me stand out. The fact that it's not a legitimate model in the eyes of majority of Iranians. The mothership, Iran, there you find a majority of Iranians who are in disagreement about going around in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere, spending the country's treasures on these adventurous foreign policy projects. Don't take my word for it. Look up anything you will in terms of protests that are happening as we speak. There is an angry Iranian population that is in disagreement with the, with the way the country's foreign policy is being conducted. And another thing that, and by the way, I mean, if that's something that for a subsequent edition, if Nader could, could perhaps consider that, uh, is to talk more about the domestic division. And I think there's a lot to be said in terms of the history of divisions on this issue of foreign policy. Mir Hossein Musavi as prime minister, um, when he write, wrote that letter of resignation to then President Ali Khamenei, the first sentence is, I don't know what the hell you're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm the prime minister. So you have had divisions within the system about foreign policy, and I would argue that is the case today. The other big crack is Arab and even Arab Shia Islamist resentment towards the idea of the Velayat al uh, Not a touches on it, but I make a very quick point. The idea of Velayat al supposedly what the Quds Force is about, it's not just about believing in Khamenei as your supreme leader for today. It's about a way of life. And I would argue across the region, and I would argue the same is true for Shias, um, the way of life that the Velayat al concept stands for is not attractive. I think a very small minority of people are attracted to this way of life. That you can counter through a much more effective narrating uh, a, a counter-messaging campaign that's missing right now from the part of the United States. Um, 
two, I mean, you could, you could make that. These are my final remarks, Patrick. Uh, in the short term, I think, I think um, for U.S. policymakers, uh, consider some of the points that Nader makes in Chapter 10 about how this network is put together. Who pays for it? You know, we're so obsessed about embargoing Iranian crude exports to China and all the rest of it. Those are wonderful big ticket items. But you need to look inside the box and find out what you can do to stop the Quds Force sustaining itself. If you look at another's book, you'll see a long list of organizations that are part of the so-called popular mobilization forces. These people are not doing this for free. It's not an easy task to do, because it means you have to pick up a fight potentially with your allies in Baghdad and elsewhere. But that's what it takes to break down the Quds Force model. That's a short-term challenge. In the long term, two questions. One, I think, is a must-do. Um, Another mentioned the Quds Force is, is supposed to outlive the Islamic Republic of Iran. If that's true, the United States needs to do a much better job in not just lumping all these groups together, but actually do the opposite, separate them from, from one another, and appreciate that they are actors within national settings in Yemen or in Lebanon and Iraq and Syria. The idea that Iran runs the whole thing and there is one big uh, agenda, I think, is is obviously outlandish. We need to do a much better job in in seeing the nuances in the in this uh, uh, the, among these groups that are allegedly are under Iranian umbrella, and a potential can do. I'm certainly not advocating for what I'm about to say, but Nader mentions in the last chapter in his book that the Islamic Republic of Iran has a zero sum game mentality. I believe in that, and if United States believes in that. All, and you don't think you can fight the Iranians. You, you said, I, I don't know if you said it or Ali said it, that there's no appetite for a big fight against Iran. Well, that's your conclusion. Then the alternative pot potentially is to talk to them. I'm not advocating for it, but that's something you can do uh, where you can, for instance, say, you know what? There are so many kilometers where you can be moving towards the uh, Golan Heights before you cross our red line. Or the same applies to Riyadh or, or, or other places in the region. So that's just a, um, an alternative way of, of, of looking at, at the problem. But again, I just want to congratulate you. The book is extremely rich in detail. It's not easy what you've done. Uh, and I say, Patrick, well done. Uh, you gave the man uh, all the support he needed, and he delivered the goods. So thank you very much. Now, usually at this point, I would, as moderator, ask the first question, but I figured that instead what I'll do is uh, turn the microphone over to, to Nader, see if he has any reactions to what he uh, just heard. Oh, well, after, Brief. very briefly, after hearing from Ali, I decided to resign from the orthodoxy, oh, no, 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 <laughs> effective no, no, immediately. No, 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 no. Uh, um, uh, Ali, the, um, the revolutionary thought in the Middle East did not start with Nasser. It goes well, well before Nasser. Um, probably should have started reading Marx and Engels and see how effective uh, their thoughts were on the, on the revolutionary thoughts in the Middle East. Uh, or at least uh, after World War II, uh, Iranian organizations uh, 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 like Today Party and all of that. That's how, how, that, how those... Uh, uh, ideas transferred. I did not say uh, the uh, founders of the IRGC, uh, and I did not say Quds Force, the IRGC. The founders of IRGC at that time, we did not have a Quds Force. We had only an extraterritorial branch of that. Uh, a founder of the uh, of the IRGC did not uh, did uh, uh, did not get their uh, revolutionary idea only from Nasser. There are a lot of sources. They have got those. What I meant uh, say that how. They came in those p days of Paris, how they came in believing that they have to create a people's army in order to topple the Shah, and if the Shah himself leaves, how to use that m people's army, which they, and I, and I said that in my uh, remarks, they copied it from, um, from Vietnamese, uh, uh, from North Vietnamese. How they're going to use that people's army to fight a protracted war uh, against possible US uh, Iranian military coup. Uh, uh, the uh, um, for uh, 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 thank you so much for uh, for uh, for both uh, for both of you for making these comments, uh, Alex. Uh, I do agree. System is not uh, uh, working well. Uh, 
uh, if I came out saying that the system is working very well, uh, that was not meant to be. Uh, as a matter of fact, the system is broken uh, uh, with all indications that you see. That's why I keep saying that even the Quds Force is getting ready uh, or is ready uh, to, to be independent, even Tehran Falls. Mm. So I do not think that uh, uh, that, uh, that system is, is well done. And uh, um, one last very quick uh, on that 17 Palestinian uh, that anecdote you used, uh, that they were in the, uh, in the, they were in the airplane coming to uh, Tehran three days after uh, victory of the revolution. I, in the book, I placed Moghania as a young Palestinian within that 17 people. He, that was the very first time that Moghania uh, set foot on, uh, on, on Iranian soil. Uh, he later stayed in Iran for a long time. He went through IRGCs and, uh, and all of those indoctrinations. Uh, and then he was sent back to Lebanon to bring out the Shiites from Fatah, which he was a part of. He was a member of the Fatah at the time, uh, to bring all the Shiites out. So yes, that was a good anecdote. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, guys, for this. Thank you. Well, thank you. So now let's see if there's uh, any questions from the floor. If not, I certainly have some. Over here, sir. Uh, there's a microphone behind you, so please. And please start by telling us your name. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting this uh, important uh, event. Uh, my name is Kawa. I'm uh, Kawa Khidr. I'm from Kurdistan 24. Uh, my question will be uh, uh, to uh, Alex, actually, just based on the on a comment, if I maybe misunderstood what he meant by the uh, foundation of uh, the finding of, of the IRGC was not based on an ideological aspect or uh, while uh, just going with a very quick example, going back to the last decades, what the IRGC's uh, movements, either politically or in the religion, religious aspects uh, done in Iraq, was a very strong sharing for the beliefs and to the stance of the Vilayat al faqih It changed too many things. So could it be the creation of IRGC a kind of a, an opposite pole to the Sunni poll in the in the Middle East world. Hmm. Um, very quickly, I I, I mean, I, Mohsen Sazagora is is he still here? Has he left? He's here. He can correct everything I say in a minute. But I again, my reading of history is it w the IRGC and the word you know sepahe pastoran, the ones who will protect. It was protecting the outcome of one revolution. you got to remember, the winter of 78, 79, you literally have hundreds of gangs, political gangs, roaming the streets of Tehran. Whoever had the arms that they had looted from the Shah's you know, various military uh, bases could call the shots politically. So the decision is to have this IRGC to protect the clergy. The clergy needed young men with guns to protect their political wins. And that's basically how the IRGC comes about. And everything that follows, I mean, I don't think Sunni Shia was an issue at all. I might be wrong. I don't think that was an issue in how IRGC was created. And I've seen plenty of evidence that many leftists, former communists, later on joined as member of the IRGC. So again, I, I don't want to make too much of this point, perhaps, but i just seen so much evidence to suggest that in that moment of of chaos and confusion, things happened that weren't necessarily preordained or ideologically shaped beforehand. They were just outcome of power struggles on the street level and how politics was, was playing itself out. By the way, one of the biggest examples of how nasty the situation is is what happened on the 4th of November 1979 and taking over the U.S. Embassy. That wasn't calculated. Nobody had calculated that. That was because that's when what faction decided to do to sort of overtake the revolution for its own benefit. But I'll stop there and... Yeah. I'm going to jump in with a question. So in uh, the last year or two, Qasem Soleimani has taken a very high-profile role. And that's uh, quite different from uh, what happened previously with regard to the Quds Force, indeed even with the Revolutionary Guards. We didn't see a commander who uh, uh, seemed to be like almost the number two in the Islamic Republic after the Supreme Leader, is uh, as important if the president, if not more important. Could you talk about that dynamic of uh, uh, why Qasem Soleimani started playing such a prominent role? and? Um, where do you see that going? Is this, a, is this going to be a precursor to a Revolutionary Guard bid for power? 
very important question. Uh, and uh, uh, during the research, during the interviews we did, uh, uh, including some interviews with people very close to Soleimani at one time or another during these past decades, uh, um, everybody's telling us that uh, Soleimani does, is not a political, does not have political ambition, uh, the way to uh, come and take over power. Uh, I'm not sure if that's if what they're saying is uh, is uh, their true reading. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I did not have a chance to interview uh, Soleimani. Uh, he would have probably invited me to the Iranian consulate in in, in Baghdad, I, 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 and I probably did not even ask for that. Uh, um, but um, um, my. My reading on that, Patrick, is that why Soleimani even should bother? He is such a powerful figure inside Iran. Becoming a president, uh, because I really believe the presidency is in charge of the day-to-day -day basis, day-to-day -day running of the government, uh, which these days uh, are facing enormous problems, probably bankrupt uh, with all these problems they have. And becoming a president, he's going to lose all that, uh, all that glory that he has. Uh, as a as, as a Quds force commander, I don't see that. As a matter of fact, the Iranian, mo at least in modern history, I'm, I'm sure it goes more than modern history. Alex can help me with that. Uh, the uh, the Iranian military has never been, has never been uh, involved in taking po uh, 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 power uh, uh, so blatantly, and and a general becomes the head of a state. We we, we don't Reza have Khan. that. Reza Khan. Uh, well, Reza Khan is uh, yeah true true no true that's but that's a whole uh, different ballgame because you are talking about uh, already uh, uh, constitutional revolution has uh, uh, has really changed the whole the whole basis of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't foresee uh, the IRGC uh, uh, or the Hots Force coming in taking over power anytime soon. If if that happens. That means things have gotten to the, such, a, such a miserable point for the, for the Iranian government that they have to do it. Uh, I think they're, they're much uh, better off to keep a veer of, of a government, normal government, uh, in, the, in the form of the present government of uh, uh, Islamic Republic than actually themselves taking power. Please. Uh, so uh, the German political philosopher Max Weber has this wonderful discussion about uh, a routinization of Charisma. And uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, to begin with, he had very little personal charisma. And after all these years where revolution is not as romantic as it may have been back in 1979, at least for some, uh, there is a need for a new face, a face who does not appear corrupt, personally corrupt, a face who is brave and an individual who has risked his own life during the, the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, whenever there were operations during the war, Mr. Soleimani was always volunteering. He would always go ahead of his men. He would even do reconnaissance missions before enemy lines, before each attack. And every single time he was sending his men to battle, he would kiss every single one of them. He would embrace them, he would kiss them, and he would go and fight alongside with them. So here you have a hero a hero who is the antithesis of the corrupt clerics who have been ruling Iran for the past 40 years. So the regime needs someone like Major General Soleimani. I do not believe that Major General Soleimani uh, is going to be a particularly good politician. Uh, and by the way, he, he did invite me to Iran uh, Mr. Soleimani, through a friend, he sent me a message inviting me to Iran, and when I declined the invitation, he invited me to Iraq. He even said that I could visit him in the green zone, but I said he, he, he's more than welcome to visit me here in Washington, D.C. We, we did not, you know, have the honor and, and, and pleasure of, of, of meeting each other, but at, at, at any rate, uh, do not focus so much on Major General Soleimani. Uh, uh, I believe that the institution of the Quds Force is more important than uh, the public persona of Major General Soleimani. Uh, the pr Iranian propaganda definitely needs someone as pure, as brave, uh, and as uncorrupt as Major General Soleimani. But what we need as researchers and scholars, what we need to, to focus on is the collective leadership of the Revolutionary Guards, 
which is also running the business of the Quds Force. So who are members of this collective leadership? I can highly recommend you, if, if, if I am allowed to, to take the liberty of, of making a small commercial. Many years ago, I made a piece for uh, American Enterprise Institute called Iran's Secret Network. And that is the network which also constitutes the collective leadership of, of, of the Revolutionary Guards. They also make the decisions for the Quds Force. This is also why I, I slightly disagree with many of the colleagues here in town who say that the head of the Quds Force directly represents you know, the Quds Force and talks directly to the Supreme Leader. Mm. I actually believe that the decisions strategic decisions are already made by the collective leadership of the Revolutionary Guards. So when Major General Soleimani shows up at the Supreme National Security Council, he is actually expressing not only the viewpoints of the Quds Force, he is expressing the viewpoints of the collective leadership of the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, I just wanted to make two quick comments. I guess one is on the issue of Qasem Soleimani. You are unhappy why he didn't invite you to, to visit him in Tehran. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, I, it takes a lifetime to get over that one. Um, but no, seriously, I, um, the Qasem Soleimani as this pure hero, uh, I think it might be something that he wants to clearly cultivate for the non-Iranians in the region, and he might have some success. But I can tell you the opposite is true in terms of his reputation among majority of Iranians who would today associate IRGC with the worst kind of corruption. The uh, IRGC, yes, but not Soleimani. Well, Qasem uh, Soleimani is a top IRGC general happens to be the head of the Quds Force, but he's an IRGC man, okay? So uh, he is certainly not a, an innocent man. He wants to cultivate that image, but I think he's struggling. He might have, more, have had more luck in Iraq and Syria, but certainly 40 years afterwards in Iran, that's not how people perceive the IRGC. So that, that's my point about Qasem Soleimani. Uh, but I agree. Why would he want to... Why would he want to give up the good life he has for, for the uncertain future of, of getting into the realm of politics. There's a, there's a real question to be asked there. But I think how I see it, uh, certainly since 2013 with the re-election re of Rouhani, Rouhani has calculated since re his re-election, but before the Trump administration pulled out of the nuclear deal, Rouhani calculated who could co-opt the IRGC that the future is Rouhani, and I'm sort of sticking my neck out here, but basically Rouhani is the next supreme leader, and IRGC backing him up. And all his speeches and so much of what he did was about saying to the IRGC, listen, we're not going to throw you under the bus. You need to make some adjustments for the sake of the rest of the country and the economy, but maybe we can find a way to work together. IRGC, by and large, has so far at least ignored him. Does that mean IRGC wants to take over in its... In, in its own right and basically turn Iran into a Pakistan where you have you know a prime minister today in the shape of Imran Khan but really the military calls the shots is that what the IRGC wants or Egyptian model or Chinese model I don't know uh, but alternatively what IRGC would want is just a different cleric, cleric then Rouhani to be the next supreme leader that's another plausible way of how IRGC could be looking at it but IRGC taking over uh, Iran in its entirety basically run the show as another pointed out, there's no basis for it. There's no basis for it. There's no external support for it. I mean, Ali mentioned Reza Khan, but you could say the British had a p big role uh, in how he rose to power. There's no external actors today looking to elevate the role of the military in Iran today, or, uh, or the IRGC. So I think the best thing they could hope for without getting themselves involved in the mess that's running the Iranian economy today and politics. I mean, you know, you literally have moments in the Islamic Republic of Iran, people who are already been vetted to be members of parliament standing up and saying out loud on national TV how everything is falling apart. This is how bad things have become. Does IRGC want to own that? I'm not sure. So I think they'd be, be, be better off probably sort of staying on the sidelines, at least officially being on the sidelines, um, and having other people take the blame for all the failures in terms of policy of the Islamic Republic. Thank you. Uh, over here, David Pollack. Yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting and lively discussion. Um, a few months ago uh, at a conference in Shanghai, of all places, I somehow found myself spending a few days with a guy that I was told was a senior IRGC commander named Mohammad Reza Shaibani, who I was told um, by an e 
foreign diplomat, was one of the founders of Hezbollah and involved in uh, taking American hostages in Lebanon. But, and this is the point of my question, uh, after that was involved very personally and directly in the Iran-Contra episode of trading arms for hostages with the United States. So my question is, what would it take, do you think, or is it possible to engineer some kind of deal between the United States and the IRGC on any of the regional issues on which we are now locked in some kind of conflict? Is there any possibility, or under what circumstances can you imagine a sort of compromise or agreement, if only a tacit one, about how far the IRGC can go in Syria or in Yemen or in Lebanon or in Iraq or anywhere, in Afghanistan, I don't know, uh, based on some combination of pressures or inducements from the United States? Or is this just not in the cards? Is the, is the IRGC always going to refuse or cheat or renege on any such agreement? You mean outside the Iranian government, direct uh, negotiation? No, 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 not necessarily directly. Um, Just with them agreeing to it. Right. And, and, and the regional aspects. Uh, the uh, the uh, divisions of, of, of opinion between the two governments, it's so much that makes that, at least in the very short term, uh, very difficult. Uh, uh, for example, in Syria. Iran wants to remain in Syria permanently. U.S. and Israel want Iran out of Syria today, uh, bringing those two diametrically opposed end state to Syrian conflict is a tall order. Uh, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, Iran wants to really convert, if it has not done already, Iraq into a, a kind of a vassal satellite state. Uh, uh, U.S. wants the Iranians uh, uh, probably outside the southern Iraq, just leave the rest of Iraq for itself and, 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 and leave the country. Uh, those are, again, two diametrically opposed uh, end state. Uh, uh, in Yemen, probably is the closest thing that they can come to uh, because both uh, uh, governments believe that the war is not getting anywhere and has to end. And if if there is a chance, I think, of the two sides, on the regional issues only I'm talking about, on the, on the two sides coming together, uh, most probably would be Yemen. Uh, 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 IRGC, uh, uh, I, think, I think Alex mentioned it in his uh, remarks, that uh, what's force uh, have easy times when to work in the, in the friendly trains, like uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, in Yemen, it's not as friendly train for for the Quds first, um, the, the Saudis, Emiratis have blockaded uh, seaports, airports, uh, and it's not easy for them to transfer uh, weapons and personnel and material uh, to the country. So they know their their, their weak points. Uh, they are uh, they are very good in very near abroad uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, not in little bit far. Uh, so so yes, Yemen might might create an occasion. Uh, so historically, the Revolutionary Guards and the United States have cooperated very, very closely with each other. You know, there has been, you know, plenty of, of very, very close encounters. You know, the Iran-Contra is one of them. You know, Iran not delivering F-14 pieces to the Soviets, you know, during the Cold War was another. Uh, prior to the 2001 U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, uh, IRGC representatives, you know, met CIA officers in, G in Geneva, exchanged information pinpointed the Taliban positions in Afghanistan so the U.S. could bombard them. More recently, we have seen the uh, you know, U.S. And, and, and IRGC cooperating with each other through the intermediary of the Iraqi government, uh, particularly in the case of, of, of Tikrit uh, campaign, where the Iran was in need of U.S. air support. So there's plenty of examples of the Islamic Republic and even the Revolutionary Guards cooperating very, very closely with the U.S. whenever there has been some kind of shared interest for both parties. Now, Every once in a while, there are some challenges, and mostly those challenges are actually domestic. Both domestic challenges 
in, in, uh, in, in the U.S. And, and, and in Iran. In Iran, the big challenge right now is not that the IRGC does not want to talk with the U.S., or President Rouhani and his technocratic government does not want to talk with the U.S. The problem is who should represent Iran in the talks with the United States. In other words, whenever President Rouhani sends a green light, a signal to the United States that he wants to talk, IRGC accuses him of treason. Whenever the IRGC was, wants to engage in a similar talk, the Rouhani government tries to scandalize them because they're afraid that the U.S. negotiations would be the key to taking over power within Iran. So, 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 so that is some of the, the that is some of the challenges that they are, they are facing on the Iranian side. Apart from the strategic issues in the region, there is also, you know, just to go back to the to the strategic issues. One of the conversations that I had with some of these people, it was actually not IRGC. It was, you know, one of President Rouhani's advisors, was that particularly prior to the Iran nuclear uh, agreement. I told him, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you cannot expect that you are able of bypassing U.S. regional allies in the Middle East and make a nuclear deal with the United States. Even if you manage to do such a thing, that deal is not going to be particularly lasting. He laughed. Oh, he said, oh, Mr. Alfona, we have already done it. We have already done it. The Israelis and the Saudis are cooked. They have no idea what to do. But of course, you know, things turn out very differently. So there are domestic set problems and there are regional settings where the IRGC, unfortunately, is not focusing too much on the broader uh, issue of U.S. allies. And that should be the case. You, you know, uh, David, just uh, being in agreement with another, I think Yemen looks like a mess. It is a mess. But for Iran's perspective, it's probably the least, you know, how would I put it f politely, in good company that we are in? Uh, they can get away with making compromises in Yemen because it doesn't involve only the United States. It involves, more importantly, arguably, the Saudis. And the Iranians are looking for a way to send signals to the Saudis, say, how long are we both going to be capable to stay in this race because we're going to get to a point where we're both going to fall off the cliff, and that's not good for you, that's not good for me. And again, to going back to Nader's book, uh, you should hire me as your PR agent afterwards. Uh, <laughs> you know, he raises the point about all the obstacles in the path of Iran when it comes to Yemen versus other places like Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. So the Yemen case, and by the way, as these talks are not going on in Sweden, just listen to Mohammad Javad Zarif and the four points the Iranians have put forward. One of those points is about political inclusion, political settlement, whatever that means, but at least they can commit themselves to something like that. But something Ali also said, which is important. Look, Ali mentioned all those moments where you had IRGC making um, compromises. But as Ali knows, we all know, there are also a list of things IRGC has done to stop a rapprochement between Iran and the United States. Those Iranian dual citizens sure. aren't just randomly held sure. back at Tehran airport sure. for no reason. That's to say to Rouhani and people exactly. who believe in Rouhani outside, as Ali pointed out, that we're here too. Don't forget us, which takes us to this fundamental problem that the Iranians have. And I'm not sure what the U.S. can do. Maybe there's things we can do. But fundamentally, they need to decide what they want for their country as a whole, as one people. They haven't made up their mind. It's about factional infighting. It's about putting factional interest above the national interest. Uh, and, you know, you want to you hear someone cry uh, telling you this? Listen to the Iranian oil minister, Bijan Zangine, who's right now in Austria. He'll tell you the cost, the billions and billions done to, that in terms of damage to that I vital industry in Iran because of factional infighting, because they can't agree what kind of investment do you want in. Do you want the Americans in? Do you want the French in? Do you want Chinese in only? I mean, the long list is there. So that's a fight for them to figure out. What do they want? What do they want as a country, and can they speak with one voice? They're not there yet. Over here, please. From the Philadelphia Inquirer, I, I wanted to ask you, um, what does the IRGC want ultimately in Syria and in Iraq? Uh, in Syria, does anyone have any leverage over them, the Russians, uh, the regime, uh, what would they like to see their power, their role like in 10 years? And in Iraq, what do they want to do with the PMUs? Do they want to create a Hezbollah take over the army from within? Or what is the vision there, do you think? 
uh, ideally they can they want to turn both Syria and, and Iraq into another Lebanon. That's that's the ideal. Can they do it? Probably not. Uh, in Syria, uh, uh, you put your finger on a very important point. It is not just between Iran and uh, and Syrian governments. It's a is a multifaceted uh, conflict going on. Uh, uh, last time I counted, there are six national armies fighting on the Syrian soil. Uh, uh, if you add Israel to the mix of the five, uh, and uh, and uh, in that very complex situation, uh, 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 Iran at times is uh, uh, taking strategies that runs counter to its original strategy. Originally in Syria, Iran wanted to send Quds Force officers, Quds Force advisors, Shia militias uh, to save Assad and to infiltrate the uh, 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 the uh, national uh, uh, structures, defense structures, and intelligence structures of Assad's regime, the way they did it in Iraq and in Lebanon. Uh, they were, they, uh, 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 but uh, uh, then they ch decided to change a strategy um, uh, and uh, challenge Israel because of the complexity of the, uh, t uh, of the uh, uh, battle space, the theater in Syria. Uh, so um, with Russians, is a, uh, the problem they're facing is that uh, Iran wants to challenge Israel on Isra Syrian soil. Russia is not an enemy of Israel, uh, the way Iran uh, is, and Russia doesn't want to have anything to do with that. As a matter of fact, uh, during the major Israeli attacks uh, on, on Iranian position, Russia's position in Syria, uh, somehow the S-400 of Russians were turned off. And it was no no challenge to to the uh, to the Israeli air attacks. So yes, uh, uh, they are they are partner in some cases with Russia. Uh, uh, Russia wants needs them as a uh, uh, as a, their uh, ground forces in Syria, at least during the height of the civil war. Now that civil war is over, Assad is basically not over, but is getting is getting to that point. Uh, uh, Russia doesn't want uh, really Iran to be aggressively changing its strategy against, against Syria. So for all of those, uh, yes, they want to make it Lebanon. Is it hard for them? Yes. Uh, Syria is getting impossible. And in Iraq, they are facing inter-Shia challenges. Uh, uh, Shia in Iraq are really not on um, one voice. And inter-Shia challenges, and that's a tall order for them. Right here, please. Hi, uh, Roy Gutman <coughs> from uh, Daily Beast. Um, I do have some observations about uh, IRGC's and Soleimani's relationship with Al Qaeda. I mean, you have Al Qaeda uh, using Iran uh, to transit and also to reside for years, as we know from the CIA documents. <coughs> uh, you have what seemed to be collaboration, or at least working in the same <coughs> direction during the American presence, uh, uh, during the uprising, the or the uh, insurgency. Uh, they were working in parallel. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, al-Qaeda or ISIS have rarely, if ever, attacked uh, Iranian targets. Extremely important question. Uh, actually, the uh, history goes back, way back, to the uh, 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 origin, uh, the, uh, f uh, the early er years of the Afghan, Afghan conflict. Uh, 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 the, uh, the Quds Force was very much present in that. Uh, the Afghan uh, 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 militants uh, that were uh, uh, partners with the Quds Force were, 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 uh, were present in that, in that battle space. But at the same time, you had not just Al-Qaeda uh, uh, Al uh, in, 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 in Afghanistan uh, fighting the, uh, during that civil war against the, uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, elements that became Al-Qaeda uh, fighting, fighting the Soviet Union, but also elements that became ISIS. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, 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 basically, the uh, Al Qaeda was based in uh, Pakistani Pakistani borders. And and uh, during my years of living in Herat, I find out that uh, a lot of the uh, ISIS started their their little groups of the uh, 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 of Al Qaeda in Herat in Western Afghanistan. So uh, uh, the the uh, the 
Shia, mili Afghan Shia militias who were partnered with Quds Force and the Quds Force officers themselves, uh, they did cooperate uh, during those years. And, uh, and uh, in the book, I think uh, have on the, on the Afghan chapter, we are showing that that continued at least working with, uh, uh, with Taliban uh, and with other Sunni extremists continued uh, beyond, beyond those years. And one last question up front. Uh, Joe Jabaley with the Lebanese Information Center. My question is about the Iranian proxies. I mean, it's obvious that today Iranian exerts its power in the region through those uh, militias, not through nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. And, and you spoke about them, you know, the Fatimi Yun, uh, Hezbollah, Hashchabi. Now, Nasrallah, of course, says that he gets everything from Iran, you know, training, weapons, uh, money, etc. What's, what's the exact relationship between the Quds Force and, and these militias? I mean, uh, is the Quds Force the one supplying everything to those proxies? And is there a clear chain of command, like Soleimani says, you have to do this, then the proxies uh, obey? Thank you. Ali would answer differently, <laughs> and orthodoxy uh, on this. Uh, um, uh, very close relationship uh, with Hezbollah. Um, I think I think probably Nasrallah was probably exaggerating that he's getting everything from Iran. But um, hey, hey, he said so. He said that they, the, the, the organization cannot eat or drink without the Iranian money. Uh, uh, that's how, how, how close that is. And it goes back to before revolution, when Chamran was in, was in uh, Lebanon and those, uh, those camps and all of that. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, individual, the, in Iraq, it was totally different. In, 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 Lebanon, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, it was only one organization, the Shia, the militant Shia is pro-Iranians uh, united under that. In Iraq, uh, for some reason, I don't, probably it's a political culture, uh, 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 there are, I, I, I listed more than 100 uh, Iraqi Shia militias in Iraq. Uh, that 80% of that work with uh, the Oxfords. Why there are so many, I'm not talking about just the majors, there's the four, four or five majors, there are, but over 100 of Shia militias working in Iraq. So uh, they, are keeping, they are keeping very close relationship with those guys. Now how does the command and control uh, relationship is? Uh, in some of the major ones is very close because goes back to Iran, Iraq war uh, with some of them like Badre, like uh, KH, like AAH. And some of the smaller ones uh, uh, is not as, as, as close. And we have seen indication of that, that they've done, they're doing some things in Iraq that Iranian didn't want them to do. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Houthis is a totally different relationship. Uh, goes back again to the very first days of revolution that the founder of the Houthis and then, uh, then the, the commander of the Houthis, it is in the book, uh, came to Iran to congratulate Khomeini and they stayed in Rome for, uh, for military doc doctrine and uh, uh, religious training and they took back to Yemen with them the idea of the Shia militancy uh, uh, which goes back to those days. So it's, uh, from those days, they, they work as, as a very close partners, and, uh, and, and Ghost Force has very uh, close relationship. Is not, I don't think, and I said it in the book, is not as commander to, uh, uh, to an organization as being commanded, more as a partnership between a senior and a junior partners. And Ali, the last word. Well, uh, for, for the most accurate information about the nature of relationship between the Iraqi militias and the Quds Force, take a look at uh, the website of American Enterprise Institute. They have released the interrogation reports, U.S. military interrogation reports of Qais Khaz Ali, who is one of the you know, militia leaders. And you get all the information you need. And, and my reading of those documents clearly indicates that uh, in those cases, the Quds Force was in full control. It was not the Iraqis trying to manipulate the Quds Force. It was the other way around. But there are two other cases uh, where, where we, we, we can discuss how things were. Uh, one is the 2006 Lebanon war, uh, which I believe was contrary to the wishes of the IRGC. The Revolutionary Guard did not want to ignite that war. And this is why Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah was out apologizing and saying it was a mistake to start the war. 
But because they started, Iran had to follow them, had no choice, could not abandon the militia. So here you have a, a case where uh, the tail is actually forcing the dog to change direction in a specific way. Uh, but, but then again, you know, another case where IRGC was in control was the 1990-1991 Iraqi Shia uprising. In that case, None of the bad core operatives, and here, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, the orthodoxy is, is, is wrong. The bad core did not participate at all. They totally let the Iraqi Shia alone to their own devices because Mr. Rafsanjani and the IRGC did not believe that the Ba'ath regime was about to collapse. And they had just had a peace deal with Iraq where Saddam Hussein accepted formal responsibility for invading Iraq in 1980. So the bad core was, was totally passive, didn't do anything. So in different cases, we have seen different examples. This question is open for, for further debate. Yeah, and uh, Alex wants a few words. Ten seconds, I promise, Patrick. But I want to go back to the question about what Iran wants in Syria and Iraq. I think that's fundamentally the most important question and one that needs to be put to the Iranian public. This is what your regime is trying to do. In your name, at your expense, are you happy with it? That question has not been put to the Iranian people in a systematic way where they would have to open up their eyes. And the regime's narrative is simple. If we don't fight them in Syria, ISIS will be downtown Tehran blowing up cars and buses and kill you because you're Persians and you're Shia. I don't buy it, and I think it would be, uh, as a policy um, step, it would be so much wiser to do a much better job showing the cost of Iran's interventions for the Iranian people. Because if you spend a billion dollars in Lebanon for a million and a half Shia community, imagine if you inherit Syria and Yemen after those wars are over. It, are the Iranian people going to be able to foot the bill? I don't think they want to go there. But we need to, as I said, have that conversation in order to shape the calculations of the Iranian regime. They are not immune to pressure, particularly when it comes from home. If it costs them politically at home, if people get upset because their sons are being asked to, as Atish members, one day have to go and fight in Syria, there will be questions asked. We haven't put those questions to the regime. We haven't uh, put pressure on the regime on that angle, and I think that has to be done. Well, I think we put some questions to you all today, and we've uh, shed a little light. Uh, I urge you to stop by uh, the desk in front and uh, consider buying a copy of the book on your way out. And thank you very much for coming.